Welcome back. We're going to start a new chapter today. This one's going to be more um, focused on what's called the product life cycle, which means that um, there are new products, there are mature products, and there are declining products. And how you would market these products depends on where they are in their life cycle. Today we're going to be mostly looking at new product development. Um, in the subsequent video lecture, we're going to look at the overall product life cycle to identify, uh, first of all, the changes that occur over time, but also what it would be some general insights about how to market products at different stages in their life cycle. So let's start with our roadmap. Um, so today what we're going to look at is one of the stages of developing a new product. Um, we're going to look at particularly the question why new products are kind of a special case because new products often fail. And they fail for a variety of different reasons. There's not a familiarity among the public with these products. Very often there is a huge upfront cost to get uh, production up for a new product. And also there's no association. So you have to create an association in the consumer's mind with your product because they haven't experienced it before. At the same time, you also have to differentiate it from perhaps competitors that might already be in the, uh, the, sp the market space. So we're, last thing we're going to look at, and this is mostly just kind of uh, previewing what we're going to see in the next video uh, lecture, which is how does marketing a new product differ from marketing a mature product? And I sort of hinted at that before, that new products, it's more about increasing awareness of the product, getting a name out there, you know, and in a sense, getting people aware with that. Um, if it's a new kind of particularly new technology product, people don't have any association with it. When it's a mature product, um, you have the legacy, first of all, of uh, people familiar with it, um, but you also might have a problem is that people already know about your product and therefore it might be harder to change how people view your product if it already has a reputation built in. So new product development, and this is just starting with um, uh, a definition. It's the development of original products, product improvements, modifications, and new brands, the firm's own efforts, and own product development efforts. Um, so this is kind of a high risk, high reward type of situation. Um, innovation can be very expensive because you have a lot of money on research and development. Um, it can be very risky because it might, while it might be a good product in itself, um, it might not have, let's say, uh, uh, people willing to buy it. And there's a lot of examples in history where they've come out with new, let's say, superior products, but people didn't want to use them. Um, the most famous example is the VHS versus Betamax for video cassettes. Now, you have to be probably my generation to fully understand that, but if you remember, there used to be uh, movies on VHS cassettes and VCRs. Um, the one that became very common was the VHS cassette. That was actually an inferior format to the Betamax, which came out about the same time. But the reason why, for example, VHS became the standard was that more people had VHS machines, and therefore they wanted compatibility with that. So even though that Betamax came out with a superior product, people did not want to use it. You see this sometimes also with a lot of uh, technology that there's kind of a first mover effect. Uh, whatever was first in the product space and first in the market space, um, you know, in a sense, captured that market. And people became, because that was what people were used to, they continued using it, even if, let's say, other products came out later. So sometimes there's always a rush to get something into market before uh, your competitors do. Um, you can see that particularly with tablets. Uh, at about the same time that the iPad came out, you also had Samsung come out with a range of tablets as well as a few other companies. Um, and obviously not all of them survived. So that is kind of the risk is that timing can be an important. Uh, but the other thing is that you're gonna have to, have to spend a lot of money before you make any money uh, marketing a new product. Um, and just think of it, some of these things you have under your control, but some of the things you might not have under your control. Let's say you're trying to launch a product here in 2020. Um, and all of a sudden, just as you're about to launch your product or your store, um, what happens is the coronavirus happens and everything shuts down. And therefore, one, you're not getting any attention, but also consumers can't go out and uh, find your product. And they're going to rely. And I think a lot of times when people are like this, they kind of, in a sense, uh, shrink their uh, shrink, shrink their spectrum of what they're looking at to the things that they want to focus. Fo uh, so think so what happens is they narrow their choices. Uh, and this is a common thing that uh, psychologists have found that in terms of scarcity, what happens is that people don't expand their choices, they tend to get more tunnel vision. Um, and that can be a bad thing if you're trying to get something new in front of the eyes of the consumer. Um, just one other example of this. Um, so there was a new uh, fast food store that opened uh, near, near me called Burger M, Burger I M. And what happened is they opened, I think, on March 10th. Um, and first of all, it's hard to start a new store, but then Imagine there's no other stores in your area. You're trying to launch a new store. You're trying to get loyalty. And five or six days in, you get kind of a statewide shutdown. And people really can't get that. Um, right next to this store, there was another um, 
Starbucks, but which obviously is well known and well established. But there was another, let's say, um, you know, Mexican food store that opened up a month earlier, got really positive reviews and has some loyalty. And what I've seen over the past month is that that first store I told you about, the burger store, um, basically shut down, although it says it's going to reopen. While the other one stayed open, even though it was a relatively new store, only opened one month earlier, um, it's still open for, let's say, takeout. And I think that's kind of the whole thing about timing, that some things are in your control, some things are not in your control. Um, and so timing, but also how you're presenting that. And as we've all heard, it's really hard to make a, uh, it's hard to make a first impression. And if you mess up that first impression, uh, you might not get a good chance to make it again. So why do we often have new product failures? Um, the first one is that people can overestimate the market size. Because there's no pre-existing data on, let's say, how many people want to buy your product, um, you can't really estimate, let's say, do I need to make 1,000 units or do I need 10,000 units or 100,000 units? So very often, everyone thinks about you know, the upside in the terms of that they want to be able to expand and upscale production. Um, but they might not realize that, you know, there's going to be more competitors they are going to eat up some of the demand for their product. So there might be not such much of a need of it. Um, there might be kind of a secular change, a change in technology that might make certain products uh, less desirable because people have moved on to a new, uh, a new level of technology. So, for example, um, in terms of, let's say, uh, 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 computer storage, uh, you used to have things like floppy disks and you, then you had CD-ROMs and then you had you know, thumb drives. And if you were really good at one of those things and it got replaced by a whole new level of technology for uh, digital storage for computers, um, it got it, it became, let's say, obsolete pretty quickly. Uh, secondly, uh, product design problems. Um, some things are only known by use, which means that uh, on paper, something might look like a really well-designed thing. Um, you might, um, uh, you might, it might look like a very attractive product, um, but when you actually get to put into use, which means you have consumers using it, um, in an everyday way, um, and I particularly find this when people write computer programs, is that when you write a computer program for yourself, you probably know what's in your mind, um, and then you write it and it works. Uh, but if someone else uses your computer program and doesn't know which keys are programmed to do certain things, or, um, or you get an input that um, you're not expecting, um, guess what? Uh, you didn't dummy proof your program, and as a result, the program crashes. Um, and I find this very often when I teach computer programming is that, uh, you know, people have an input and they expect to get like a number, but then someone hits, you know, a cat jumps on their keyboard and they get a bunch of letters and the computer doesn't know what to do with that. And so one of the things like uh, when you do programs is that you have to uh, uh, make sure that it only will accept the input that you have. Um, we'll talk about one example later, something like a, a straight razor for like a, for a men's, a men's razor. Um, it might look like an improvement. Um, but the point is that if you don't use it on your face, you might not know how people use it, how people pull it, and it might have weaknesses in the design that make it less, let's say, usable than it was, let's say, the idea in the head. Um, it might be incorrectly positioned, which means you, when we talked about before about uh, market positioning and uh, segmentation of the market, it might not be, let's say, um, positioned well. So, for example, uh, you want it to be the low price, but then someone else, in a sense, uh, jumped the gun and, and was able to put a, a lower price on it. Uh, you might not be pricing it at the, it might be, people might like your product, but they might not like the price that it's at. Um, if you ever go to like a new restaurant and you say, well, I really like the food, uh, but it's kind of on the pricey end, so I'm not sure that I'm going to come back. And sometimes it might not be advertised to the market segment that's really going to use it, which means uh, you were targeting one uh, segment of the market, but really where you, the demand for it was somewhere else. And these things happen because you don't have information, you don't have data on, how, on what the public's reaction to your product is, and therefore the likelihood of mistakes are higher. Um, you can have someone who has a pet project and they're going to push it, even though uh, most people who are doing research say that it doesn't work. Um, there might The cost of research and development might be greater than you anticipated. Um, and that what might happen is you might get a competitive reaction, which means that um, you're not putting it into a static market. People are not just going to continue doing what they're doing. If you come in with a disruptive uh, innovation or disruptive product, people are going to do something in reaction to it because they're not going to try to go out of business. And that might be something you anticipate, and that reaction might swamp your initial presentation of your product. So what are some stages you might go through in developing a new product? So this diagram, I think, kind of illustrates some of the things you want. So like any, any 
and this kind of diagram I think is you see this all the time is that you have an idea you uh, brainstorm some of the idea you t uh, you develop it you test it you go back and evaluate it after but let's go we're going to talk about these in detail as we go forward for the rest of this video lecture but let's talk about them a little bit right now so the first of all you have to have your idea so where do your ideas come from um, your ideas can come from inside your company they can come from outside your company like customers um, and so the point is that um, we have this idea that you, we have research and development and it's a bunch of people in lab coats and you know and goggles and you know they're kind of in secrecy developing this new idea probably with a chemistry set um, and that generally is not where a lot of ideas are generated um, one very interesting um, idea on this is that uh, Matt Ridley is an evolutionary biologist um, said that uh, you uh, you know you have what's called uh, sex for ideas and what he meant by that is that just like sexual reproduction among um, in the natural world the way that ideas generate is usually by bouncing off each other and you see this in terms very often in terms of how memes are developed and there's a lot of research right now on the development of memes and how they kind of go viral and how they spread although viral is probably not the best term in this environment um, but the idea is that there might be one idea of like the original let's say work that people are building the meme off and then there might be let's say other people read that and they recreate it or create variations on that and so what Matt really was saying is that most of the ideas generating business come from not people having an abstract idea but by use and um, in a sense diver uh, using things in a diverse way which means that uh, um, you usually have some simple ideas or simple machines and then they combine as they're exchanged between different cultures so when we often talk about cultural diffusion is the I we sometimes talk about it as if let's say there's an invention in one place in the world and then that invention just spreads out without being changed like you're making a Xerox copy um, but what Matt really was saying with generally what happens with cultural diffusion is that when you have more interaction you get more sharing of ideas and it doesn't just go in one direction from the source to the periphery but it goes in both ways as people are kind of let's say swapping ideas and therefore coming with new uh, products so idea generation is one of these things where we think it's really smart people or people who have had success in the past but it might be more amorphous and more like social process uh, than our conventional idea uh, sees it uh, we can have secondly after we have an idea we have to screen the idea which means there are many different ideas a lot of people have patents very few of them actually become marketable uh, projects so we have to say is this idea practical how would we do this how would we manufacture this um, is there a market out there for this um, and, and, and things of that sort can we locate the raw materials involved in this um, we have to do you know concept uh, development and testing which means that how would this go in practice so let me just give one example that I've been following recently about uh, doing contact tracing uh, using uh, location data from uh, cell phone devices so uh, what happened is that uh, Google and uh, Apple got together and see like could you do something where you could trace contact by people's cell phones which means that if you got a positive test for COVID um, you would know who your phone was close to and therefore what other people might be um, might you know have you might have spread it to um, and so first of all they had to develop the software to do that that was not the hard part they were able to do that compatible and make it work on both platforms Apple and Android um, but then they did a survey um, and about you know would you be comfortable with doing this and most people said no because it would be a violation of privacy um, and so the point about it is that even though they got the technology to work even though there's clearly a need for something like contact tracing uh, given the circumstances we're in um, that when you actually surveyed people about would they be comfortable allowing this to be used most people said no uh, because they felt it would uh, I think what most people feel is that I know how to isolate myself and I don't necessarily need my phone to do that and I think they're also thinking from the individual perspective and maybe not from the social perspective so the point is that it's not that the product uh, is impossible to exist it's that the product might not fit how consumers are using it and so the point is that how can we make this product um, and address their concerns about privacy about how it will be used um, then once you've got the concept and you know the prototype and things of that sort how are you going to market it how are you going to sell it how are you going to position it um, and then you have to go to um, well like what's it going to cost do we have the money uh, how are we going to produce it how are we going to uh, distribute it uh, then we have to maybe develop the final product and then test market it which means put it out there in the public and see whether um, it actually works um, something that's um, similar to this is like how the 
when they develop regents examinations is that they kind of pretest questions to see how fair they are. So I might write a question for a regents exam, um, and I look and you look at the uh, uh, you know the state standards and things of that sort, and see what type of things. You, and, and my experience is mostly with the history regents is that um, they usually uh, test questions in the two or three years before that. So generally, how re the regents were set up, and now the, the format has changed, is that in the last five questions, they would ask variations on questions. Um, and these questions usually became questions that were included um, in the first part of the test, um, you know, in later years. And so if you looked at tests over a long period of time, you could see you could see kind of the change in how they were thinking about things and how they want to ask information on different topics. So we were talking about this before, but let's talk a little bit more about idea generation. So um, internal sources, which means there are a lot of people in a company um, and some companies have deliberate um, ways of trying to encourage innovation, encourage idea generation, um, and brainstorming within their company. So this one here talks about Samsung, uh, which is an idea of bringing people together and bringing people who are working in different parts of the company to kind of share ideas. Give me some technical people with some artistic and design people. Um, one of the best examples of this is the firm 3M, uh, which is famous for developing things like scotch tape, um, sandpaper, but most recently, you know, they're the ones who are one of the big uh, manufacturers of N95 masks. Um, but one of their more interesting things is post-it notes. Um, and what they did at 3M for a long time back in the 80s and 90s is they would give um, a whole slate of their employees the Friday off to work on their uh, own projects, which means that it doesn't have to be related to something we're actually doing. It doesn't have to be related to an existing pro uh, project. Uh, why don't you spend some time just you know, developing new ideas? Um, and then those ideas would become, let's say, products of the company. Um, and the post-it note came from, you know, obviously scotch tape and uh, uh, removable tape. But uh, there was a person who was in a church choir, and uh, there was a big thing where they wanted to keep track of the pages that they were changing from one song to the other. Um, and at that time, what people would do is they would take a strip of paper, and they might uh, sometimes have colored paper, and they would put that note in, and they would use it as a bookmark. Um, but that proved cumbersome because either you had to tape it onto the page and then it became permanent and maybe destroyed the page when you took it off, um, or you, you know, it could fall out and you would lose your track. And so he developed the post-it note to kind of help him organize the uh, sheet music uh, for his church choir. And that might be an example of how um, ideas develop. Uh, more recently, we have the IBM uh, Thomas Watson Center in Yorktown Heights, and that is, you know, basically working on pure research. And they've done things like, I think, Deep Blue, which was a chess playing program, to develop the Watson computer to play Jeopardy. These are not actual commercial products, at least not at the time by IBM. Another thing that was developed there was fractal geometry um, by Benoit Mandelbrot. And um, they encourage people to kind of just play with ideas and develop them. Uh, some other examples that where there's kind of a deliberate effort to innovate things, uh, uh, what was called Bell Labs, uh, which developed things like fiber optic cable, uh, was, uh, you know, and later became Lucent, which was, uh, uh, part of, I believe, AT&T, um, was in, uh, in, outside of Princeton in New Jersey, up in Rochester, New York. You had Xerox PARC, P-A-R-C, P -A -R -C. Um, and they developed things like the graphic interface that we all use if you're using something like Windows or Apple to this day. I believe, um, I'm not sure, it was Xerox PARC or it was Bell Labs that developed the first computer mouse. Um, but these are examples of people like just bouncing ideas off each other. Um, in one influential book, um, an author named Annalise Saxanian, who studied uh, Silicon Valley and Route 128, um, looked at why Silicon Valley became successful, but Route 128 around Boston um, did not become a center of uh, computer innovation. And what she found is the difference in culture that in Silicon Valley, it was very common for people, technical people, to share their ideas across companies, i.e. there was no secrets. But around the Boston area, despite having MIT in their backyard, um, they did a lot of defense research, and defense research uh, emphasized uh, secrecy. And as a result, people didn't share ideas across firms. And as a result, they were less dynamic in developing new products. However, as I was saying before, um, that one huge, sometimes not acknowledged source of idea generation are external sources. Very often, customer feedback, uh, competitors, uh, people who are buying products from you, um, you know, they have needs or they have something they want to use. Uh, but might either have the capacity or maybe, let's say, the, app, the ability to 
develop their idea into something that's practical. So I talked a little bit of this in terms of shopping is that uh, the way that people use products is sometimes different than let's say the original design use. In a previous video lecture, I talked about um, the singer uh, songwriter, Billy Joel, and he was discussing like how musicians were using synthesizers. And the original design of a synthesizer was to be able to create orchestral music, the idea that a single person could create all the um, instrument sounds for a much larger um, uh, arra um, arrangement, so you know, an orchestra or a band. Um, instead of like hiring all those people to be your studio uh, band, uh, you can kind of do, do that and design it on their own. And so the synthesizer had this whole thing about how to create violins and uh, bells and woodwinds and things of that sort. Um, but what Billy Joel said is that that's not how a musician sees it. He doesn't see it as uh, a technology to create instruments. He says, what? it's a new instrument of its own. And he says, I just got the keys and banged around throughout the manual um, and found that kind of new sound that this could produce. And so if you know that late 70s, early 80s synthesizer sound, that is really what came out of people in use of it. Um, and that became the major use of it rather than in a sense to recreate orchestral music. So after you have this idea generation phase, you're going to move on to idea screening. Um, and the idea here is that we have many ideas and you should always keep track of all your ideas. But the point is that you have limited resources, limited time, limited attention. Um, and you want to kind of, in a sense, focus on what you might think are better ideas and to, in a sense, spend less time or to kind of sideline or save for later the ideas that are maybe not as well formed or less likely to be successful. So most companies that are kind of large companies that are trying to sift through a variety of ideas, um, they have to figure out whether, first of all, is this practical? Second of all, is there a market for it? Um, how long would it take to develop this to get it to market? Um, and would, would we actually get a rate of return, which means like even if we were able to sell it and people would buy it, can we sell it for enough money that it makes sense to devote a lot of resources to that? Um, and you might reject it if the profit margin isn't large enough. So the point is that you only have maybe a limited ability to produce products, which means manufacturing capacity. Uh, you might only have a limited number of stores. Uh, you might only have a limited amount of shelf space in retail stores. And therefore, you can't sell everything that you're able to produce. Uh, you have to know whether you're going to be able to place this out there in front of consumers. And the answer may often might be, no, we don't have a way to distribute this. So we have to, there has to be some criteria usually to screen these ideas. And sometimes, you know what? You, um, you're, there you, you let some good ideas go away. It doesn't mean that you did things wrong. It just means that uh, in a process like this, mistakes are inevitable. Um, but you shouldn't worry about the things you were not able to do. You should worry, you know, did you make the best choices among the things that were in front of you at a particular point in time and not regret perhaps that other people, uh, you know, other people uh, were successful with an idea that you threw away. So. The next step would be kind of the concept development, which means that you have to make it more tangible and practical. And so you're gonna to need to write down what is it the product that the company can offer to the market, which means not just something you're writing on the back of an envelope, but something that you know actually has a form, uh, what materials is it gonna be made out of, how is it gonna be packaged, where it's gonna be distributed. Um, and then you have to kind of, in a sense, write this down and make it more concrete. And you might, within that is a product concept, which is, what does this product mean in terms of consumer terms? Which means, what need or want are you satisfying with this product among the consumers? Uh, because even though your product might be unique and there might be something that replicates it, there might be another product out there that solves the consumer need or want already and therefore there's not, let's say, a demand for it because there's an alternative there. So for example, if you don't like a particular flavor of soda, um, like you might come up with a new flavor of soda, but if people like the existing flavors, their you know their need or want for thirst is already satisfied, and they're not necessarily going to want to have more choices. And then lastly, you have to um, uh, you know test this concept with actual people. So you might do surveys, you might do experiments um, in a maybe a limited small way to see which ones are going to appeal to consumers more. So. Once you have, you know, a tangible product that you can describe, um, you have to think about how you're going to sell it. And so this is where things we've talked about having a marketing plan, uh, the marketing mix. Uh, what is the product? What is the price you're going to sell it at? Where is it going to be distributed? Um, 
how you what gimmicks are you going to do it are you going to have it you know connected to other things they're going to have cross marketing and things of that sort um who are you going to sell to so some things we've talked about in previous video lectures like segmenting the market which markets you're going to target with that um what is the value proposition which means why do why would people think this is a higher value in your product compared to things that are existing um and what sales and what market share you're likely to have as a particular firm or company um once you have a sense of that then you might make you know hard decisions about what's the price we're going to sell it at uh how much money are we going to devote to marketing and promoting this and this can be very important because um it's not simply the case that you build a better mousetrap and the world beats a path to your door um you might have a very large marketing budget if you think that getting the word out there is the most important thing or you might have something like look um we're just going to put it out there and we'll let word of mouth do most of the work um and then the last thing you have to understand is like what happens if this product takes off or doesn't take off um are we going to be able to ramp up um are we going to have larger profits down the road um what happens to our long long run sales which means is this going to be a fad or a gimmick which means it's going to be very popular for a short amount of time and then it's going to disappear and we're going to develop a new product like you know something like this might be something like fidget spinners or a particular fashion trend or is it something that eventually everyone is going to want like a smartphone or a dishwasher or things of that sort um and so the point is you have to have some idea that if your product if your product becomes too popular are you going to have the ability to satisfy that because i think one of the dangers is that um if you only have a certain level of inventory and you sell out people might be dissatisfied by the fact that even though it's a good product um they might not be able to obtain it and they might in a sense their attention might move on to something else So part of that is you know the business analysis and something we've been talking about is that it's not just whether your product or idea is good it's whether it fits into the overall business that your firm or company is doing so if you have a great product but it costs more to make than what you can sell it for in the market it's probably not something you're going to pursue um so if you have a product that is competing or cannibalizing with another existing product you have you might not pursue that because you might want to have a more mature stable product rather than kind of innovate and throw more products out there all the time um you might want to be able to control that you might want to hold it back and wait for a time where certain products become obsolete before releasing let's say a new version or addition um and so the idea is that it doesn't just have to be a good idea it also has to make business sense and very often there are some very good ideas that are not practical in terms of a business um And lastly, you know, okay, so now you have this concept, you have a drawing, you have to make it into a physical product. And this is where you're going to uh, a lot of money is going to be spent because once you get to a large scale um manufacturing, you're going to basically have to build higher workers. You're going to have to uh, create uh by real estate and buildings, you're going to have to create equipment to produce it. You're going to have to have a way to distribute it to the sellers. You're going to need to have prototypes that people you know the retailers and the wholesalers that are going to move your product are going to be able to let's say um okay this is how it works and you know in a sense rather than just saying well they, here's an idea and here's a wish you know and say well that sounds great they probably want something tangible if it is a tangible uh a good or a service maybe a demonstration so i think that um you know very often i see this times with restaurants uh when they go for financing at banks is they might actually make one of their meals or dishes their signature dish um they might bring in a sauce to let them taste it so that people have something to grab onto rather than the idea that this is a restaurant and this is what's going to be on our menu um and you know you might even want to pro- um product test in the terms of like the physical characteristics is it flimsy um is it going to go together it does it break a lot and even though you think that might be able to be understood before you make the um the product sometimes um for example the way uh, i think particularly like a uh, dog chew toys um i can't tell you how many different uh, dog uh, chew toys that have promised that they're really really tough and they're going to last forever and they're up for heavy like chewers that my dogs have destroyed them within 5 minutes and so you it, it does it has to hold up to real use um because the way that an actual consumer or an actual user might use your product Uh, might be different than let's say I was talking about before about computer programs is that they're not necessarily going to be able to use your product in a smart way because there's not a familiarity with it and you want to minimize the things that can misuse your product and make it either dangerous 
um, or uh, breakable or um, difficult to use. There's a whole science of design and there's a whole science of ergonomics that design things to, um, you know, to, uh, for how actual users are going to interact with it. Um, just because it's right in front of me, the computer mouse that you see that's kind of like round shape and kind of fits in the palm of your hand was not how commuter mice were originally designed. The first ones were very blocky, uh, very triangular, very geometric, and you know they had sharp points and it didn't really fit into your hand very well. Um, and so the one where you know the thumb fits onto the side is a product of study and developing um, a product from something that was maybe not was worked functioned the same, but didn't actually in a sense interact with the consumer. Um, or the user as, as, as best as you might want. And that comes from developing your product. So one example of this, and this is a Gillette men's razors, is that uh, they had employees volunteer, you know, to shave their faces with their new product. Um, and this is not just, let's say, the razors, but also the foam and the aftershave and things of that sort. Um, and, you know, they studied people really using it and seeing how, what, you know, did you actually did it, um, you leave like spaces on your face that weren't cut as closely? Did you get you know the rounding on it? Um, and so something like this uh, can prevent you from making huge investments on products that are are going to be duds. Um, have real people use your product and get their feedback on it. So what this is part of is kind of this um, testing the marketing, which is that you might want to try different messages. So very often you have focus groups and you have them with different names or different titles uh, to, to a product and see whether people like them better. You can try different types of packaging. Um, this is not necessarily needed from all, all products because some products are variations on something that exists and something that works. Um, and the reason why you might not want to do that is that there's not a high profit margin. Uh, test marketing and product testing can be very expensive. Uh, time consuming, so you might lose your your window in terms of time, but also you might spend more money developing your product than the profit margin would um, would justify. And so you have to kind of, you don't want to make a mistake and therefore you want to get it right. So you do want to test some of these ideas out before you release, release it to the market. At the same time, um, you have to kind of keep in mind the expense that these things take and that are you going to be able to make that money back um, if your product is successful and that, uh, you know, you have to make more money than just, let's say, the cost of manufacturing your product. So one example of this was uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken's Grilled Chicken. Um, and this is, you know, it's a large firm. And, you, and even though you might say, well, this is not, they make chicken, they should understand how to do this. Uh, they had to be able to make the patties. They had to change maybe, change the equipment that's in their various stores. And if you have a lot of different franchises, that could be a very expensive and costly investment. Uh, people might not like the taste. Uh, people might not like you changing your your product for something that is not um, changing your product to something that you know differs from your original product that they did like. Um, and so this uh, grilled chicken, um, especially you know in Kentucky Fried Chicken is the name. Kentucky Grilled Chicken is is changing something that has a strong association. And so they test marketed for three years before they actually rolled it out as, let's say, a universally, let's say, available um, uh, item on their menu. So once you've got to this thing and you're sure you have a good prop, you're going to commercialize uh, the product, which means um, you're going to decide when to release it, how to introduce it. Um, a great example of this is like, you know, Apple has kind of an announcement show every year where it used to be Steve Jobs and now Tim Cook gets up dressed in a black tur turtleneck and introduces their new line of products and they make it such an event that everyone knows that my wife knows what day it is and tunes in and watches the new Apple products roll off because she wants to see what's a new phone going to be like, what's a new tablet, what uh, features it's going to have. Um, and so the point is they get a lot of attention when they release a product where some other things are not as visible. Um, so you, as we were saying about Kentucky Grilled Chicken, you might release it in an area of the country and see how it works there, maybe in the best possible market or something where you have a strong reputation, um, and then maybe try to expand out of a regional distribution to, let's say, a national distribution. So a lot of and is, is that we, we've uh, beaten this drum quite a bit, is that even though new product is focusing on the actual product, we don't want to 
fall into marketing and myopia, which means that we focus on the product more than the customer. Um, and so you always want to think in terms of a new product as satisfying some customer need, which means you shouldn't just say, what are the features of this product? Uh, I, you know, what is its functionality? What is its cost? What it will take to make it? You eventually want to evaluate in terms of like, it's the customer is going to see this as a wonderful thing. They're going to see value in it um, and that you're going to be able to capture that value. And because new product is obviously for inherently product centric, you might have to make an effort to kind of get away from the details of the product and get more to what is the real, what is the real need and want being satisfied with this. So one example of, um, you know, a customer centered pro um, product is Nerd Wallet. So there's nothing new about this in terms of it gives you like financial tools and money management, things of that sort. Um, but the virtual, uh, um, you see this sometimes in Nerd Wallet, I think is a different product, but the virtual wallet basically gives you a way that's going to satisfy a particular demographic. In this case, it's the millennials who like to do things online, who like things done with their phone, um, maybe an older demographic. So this is kind of an example of uh, providing something that is useful for to a particular market segment. Um, and therefore it's kind of satisfying their need because they're concerned about money, but they're also in a sense, not kind of your state traditional customer. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up here. And when we come back in our next video lecture, we're gonna talk about the product life cycle, um, which means we're gonna talk about not just new products and innovation, the early adopters, we're gonna talk about mature products and also declining pro uh, products. So we're gonna basically just treat what we did today as one stage of a longer process. That's it for now, and uh, I'll see you next time.